Welcome to the seventh episode of Angiopod, the podcast for vascular fanatics. Since the oral ports are around the corner, we have created a series of mock oral reviews with experienced vascular surgeons. Dr. Kuldeep Singh will introduce today's special guest examiner, and we have Dr. Meena Kirkis, the vascular fellow at Staten Island University Hospital, who has kindly agreed to partake in this episode. Let's get started. Uh, well, welcome to our seventh episode of our podcast. Uh, today, we have a special guest, Dr. Alfio Croccio. He's the chief of vascular surgery at Atlantic Cell Hospital. He's also the program director for the vascular residency program. And he's been kind enough to join us here today for our mock oral examination. He will be interviewing one of our fellows at Staten Island University Hospital, Mina Gurgis. Dr. Croccio, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. So whenever you want to start, you can start. You can give Mina a, a scenario. And uh, Mina, just take it from there. Let's see how it goes. Sure. So Mina, how are you? Okay? Good. How are you, sir? How are you? Great. Uh, Mina, I'm going to present a case for you. Tell me what you think. You have a gentleman that's presenting to the emergency room with fatigue over the past several months. He overall doesn't feel well. He's a uh, low-grade tachycardic, but uh, not in shock by any means. And he has really nonspecific type uh, findings. As of note, historically, he's had a open abdominal aortic aneurysm repair maybe 10 years prior. So on physical exam, his temperature is approximately 101. He um, doesn't have any overt um, signs of either respiratory or genitourinary or GI complaints, but he doesn't feel sick. And he says on occasion, he does have some abdominal discomfort, but nothing more specific. The emergency room notifies you that they did a CAT scan, and interestingly, the aneurysm repair that he had open 10 years ago uh, raises a question as they see what appears to be some fluid and small little streaks of air around the graft. So what do you think? Uh, so at this point, uh, the concern is for an aortic graft infection, given the CT scan findings and the overall presentation of the patient. Uh, I want to know more about the vascular exam on physical exam. How are the distal pulses and his, uh, his vascular exam? Certainly. So his uh, abdomen is uh, consistent with a midline incision from his previous repair. The uh, femoral arteries bilaterally are palpable and normal. Uh, his low extremity pulses are also palpable. Uh, there's no evidence of M&E emboli. There's no enhanced pulsatility in his popliteal arteries. So essentially, it's a normal exam. Okay. And how old is the patient? 74. All right. So um, at this point, I would start with obtaining a CBC and a BMP. And my conversation with the patient would be that he has what appears to be an infected aorta graft. Um, and the typical treatment for this would be excision of operative excision of the graft, as well as creation of an extra anatomical bypass or creation uh, of an inside shoe uh, graft using uh, either autologous vein, uh, using femoral vein, or using rifampin uh, bind did graft. So that would be my conversation with the patient, but first I would like a preoperative workup, including EKG, CBC, BMP, and uh, take it from there. Okay, his... Um... And also, I would like to, uh, I'm sorry, I would like to start him on uh, broad-spectrum antibiotics and obtain some blood cultures as well. Okay, so blood cultures sent off. His white cell count is slightly elevated, maybe 13 or so. The rest of his electrolytes all appear normal. EKG, unchanged from previous. He's signed his rhythm. And um, there's a question of a T-wave inversion, but he's had that before. Okay. And which antibiotics would you want to start? Uh, Rocephin and Flagyl. Rocephin and Flagyl. Okay. So uh, which of those options do you wish to pursue? So um, given his he's uh, elderly, I would uh, give him the option of the extra anatomical bypass and excision of the aortic graft with closure of the aortic stump. Okay. So what what is extra anatomic bypass? So I would uh, choose... It can be either a femoral, femoral, or an axial, or axial bifemoral uh, graft. Uh, in this case, I would do an axial bifemoral graft. Okay. And uh, from which side are you doing that? I'm going to take it from the left side. Left side. Okay. And talk to me about timing or staging of these. Wh which would you do first? Uh, I would do the extra anatomical bypass first, and then um, uh, see how he does in that operation, just so I can establish uh, vascu revascularization to the lower extremities. And then I would come back and do excision of the aortic graft. And come back when? Uh, about two to three days later. Okay. Uh, what, why, why wait the three days? Uh, just uh, give him uh, time to recover from the operation. Uh, typically, you wait about two to three days. Okay. So the three days go by. She appears to be doing well from that. What uh, What's what's involved with the second stage of your operation? The second stage of the operation would be um, 
a uh, general general anesthesia, transport neural approach, expose the aorta graft, um, and then um, find a healthy aorta in renal above the graft, clamp it, and um, go down and find the distal anastomosis, uh, excise the graft, debride the aorta, uh, or correction, excise the graft, and uh, staple off the proximal stump, and then um, leave dreams. Okay. Uh, Ten years ago, endo was pretty popular still, so the proximal anastomosis, he was not really an endo candidate at the time. His proximal anastomosis was right at the level of the renals, and it was a, it was a bifurcated graft, and it went to a zilliac bifurcation. So where, where do you want to put your staple? And there is no, uh, well, there is no room, you said it's right at the renals, correct? Uh, the anastomosis of the graft was at, in the, at the aorta immediately below the renals uh, well if there is if there is not enough uh, room to put the staples below the renals i would have to bypass to the renals and then put the staples right above them okay what are you going to bypass with uh, in an infected uh, area i would uh, use autologous vein okay uh, from where from typically it's um what's recommended is the femoral vein or the saphenous vein but the femoral vein requires more extensive section I would, i'll probably try using um yeah, I would use a femoral vein. Okay. Both sides? One side? I would start with one side. Okay. And how are you going to deal with the distal end? The distal went to the iliac bifurcation. And the question is, where would I staple it, right? Yeah. Or whatever you would do. Whatever you choose. What, what would you choose to do in a situation like that? So I would staple off right where the distal anastomosis is at the, at the bifurcation. And uh, I would be depending on my extra anatomical bypass to retrograde fill into the uh, internal iliac. Okay, Mina. So in this process, you uh, the graft doesn't look pretty. It uh, there's a purulence around it. There's some necrotic tissue uh, surrounding that. What do you think we should do with all that? So I would debride as much. Well, first of all, how is the patient doing uh, intraoperatively? Is, is he stable still? He seems to be doing okay. Um, he lost a little bit of blood. Okay. But uh, stable. Anesthesia is replacing what is necessary. Hemodynamics seem to be okay. He's still making some urine. Okay. So I would debride as much of the necrotic tissue as possible, send uh, send some tissue off for culture, and uh, place drains, and um, try to uh, cover the aortic stump with uh, a piece of momentum and close the retroperitoneum over it. Okay. Very good. Why don't we change gears and uh, discuss the next case? Okay. If you're okay with that, Mina, uh, the next patient um, is one of your colleagues basically tells you that um, he has a heavy smoker. He's young, 55 years old, has complained to pretty uh, severe claudication, half to one block, no pulses palpable at his femorals, popliteal, or pedals. So he did some non-invasive testing in his flat uh, waveforms in his thighs, downward. ABI is about 0.4 on each side. He gets a CTA and the order up to the level of the renals from proximal to the level of renals seems to be pretty healthy. Uh, below the renals, there's about a two centimeter segment that's healthy. Then he starts building up a lot of atheroma and eventually about two centimeters above the aortic bifurcation, it's occluded and bilateral common iliacs are occluded. And then his externals are patent. The hypogastrics are patent. They're a little on the smaller side than his femorals are a little bit larger. And then his SFAs, he has bilateral high grade at the adductor canal. Okay. Uh, so uh, this gentleman is presenting with a um, what sounds like a task uh, D, uh, aorta iliac occlusive disease. His, uh, sorry, how old is he? 55. And does he have any comorbid conditions? How is his overall? No, he smokes. He smokes, says otherwise he's healthy. He tells you he's been playing uh, soccer with his friends up to a few years ago. Then he started slowing down a bit. But otherwise, he looks like he has good musculature. He's a worker, construction worker. He looks pretty healthy. Okay. So he seems like a pretty healthy guy. Um, I would uh, have a discussion with him uh, about uh, the creation of of an aorto bifemoral bypass, uh, which will uh, provide the best survival for him and longest patency rate. Okay. Would you consider medical management first, maybe? Yeah, I, I would, be, especially given the fact that he doesn't have any tissue loss uh, or rest pain. He seems like he's the only having a claudication. So what would you suggest? So um, uh, I would uh, put him on aspirin, su suggest um, an, an exercise, a graded exercise program, and um, and possibly put him on, maybe the data for Pletal has been kind of questionable, but uh, I will try him on a trial uh, on uh, a dose of Pletal. Okay. How much Pletal are you going to give him? I'm not sure of the dose. Okay. Should we give him a statin, you think? Yes. And I will add a statin to that. Okay, great. So since you have some luxury of time, you, you, he actually ends up deciding to stop smoking, which is great. You tried the statin for him and the uh, Pletal, and he's actively walking. Um, 
but uh, comes back six months later and says that, you know, it, it really hasn't helped much. So uh, sometimes I can walk up to a block, but it's usually still the same half a block. Uh, is there anything else we can do besides the medicine? Well, at this point, he, um, he failed medical therapy. I would offer him the surgical approach, which would be an aorta bifemoral bypass. Okay. Why don't you... Um... Why don't you tell me why you wouldn't do a stent first? Well, it is um, number one, he's a young guy. Uh, an aorta bifemoral bypass would offer a long term patency rate and best survival rate for him. Um, and an endovascular approach in him, in particular, would be challenging because of his extensive disease, especially given that uh, the disease extends all the way uh, up to the uh, close to the renal. Okay. So. Fair enough. So tell me about the surgery. How are you going to do it? Well, after preoperative workup, including labs and EKG, um, I would uh, put them under general anesthesia and uh, the surgery would, would be an aorta bifemoral bypass. I would create the femoral incisions first, um, dig out the common femorals bilaterally. Uh, then I would do a midline incision and uh, expose the, um, the aorta and uh, pretty much track healthy aorta from the renals, find a place to clamp and uh, go down to the iliacs and clamp there as well. The question will be whether to do an end-to-end or an end-to-side anastomosis. Um, the preoperative CTA uh, showed that the external iliacs are patent, uh, therefore I would do an end-to-end anastomosis in him. Um, if the external iliacs were diseased, I would do an end-to-side anastomosis. And uh, I would use a Dacron graft. Okay, what size? Oh, well, depending on the size of the aorta, either it's going to be uh, 16 or 18 by, uh, by 8 or 9. Okay. His IMA was open. What do you want to do with that? That means that um, you would have to implant the IMA because sacrificing that would, uh, would put them at risk for ischemic colitis. I'll, back, I'll backtrack here. If there is an IMA that is open and patent, I would, I would probably end up doing, I would do an enticide anastomosis just to, to preserve integrate flow to that IMA. Okay. So how do you want to place or tunnel this? Where would you put it? So I would tunnel it from the, from the groans up and it would, uh, it would be, uh, I would do it uh, with caution to um, not injure the ureters, it would track right over the external iliacs um, and uh, tunnel it into the uh, retroperitoneal space. Okay. Should we put it above the ureters or below the ureters? Below the ureters. Okay. And um, should we cover our graft with anything or no? Yeah, you should cover it with, um, well, I would, I would close the retroperitoneum over it. Okay, great. All right. Well done, Mina. Thank you. Sure thing. All right. That was a very nice discussion. Thanks, Mina. Thank you, Dr. Caraccio. Mina, just... Uh, a few things, and I guess to Mina and others that will be taking the board soon, is how to answer these questions. Uh, one thing is obviously your knowledge base. The other thing is how you answer it, how smooth it comes across, and how confident you are. So you want to be confident in your answers. You can go back and say, that, I, I take that back. Actually, I wasn't thinking, or whatever you need to say. It's they, They're not trying to get you. Uh, this is a, a very, you know, it's, a, it's not a, a very difficult exam. They just want to make sure that you do the safe thing. Uh, so sometimes you can get nervous, but you do have to have a flow in your answers. You don't want to trip up. You don't want to have long pauses. So if you don't know the answer to something, you can ask them again, but you need to uh, continue that conversation, have that conversation going. So try not to have a long pause. Um, a pause is okay, but sometimes the pause goes way too long. And now the examiner is saying, well, okay, I think this person just has no clue and is just completely taken uh, you know, taken off track, and that's when they are going to start really getting into you. And it's basically sharks that smell blood. Uh, so you don't want to allow that to happen. Just have a conversation like you're having a conversation with uh, with your friend, and, and you'll be fine. But otherwise, you did, you did pretty good. Uh, so with that being said, let's, let's move on to the discussion. Let's talk about that first scenario. I've been writing down, as you guys have been discussing, one of the things um, to remember for, for the first scenario, the Aortic graft infection, just to remember, the most common organisms for these are typically staph and, and E. coli. So when you tailor your antibiotics, you want to make sure you're covering covering those two organisms. Now, a couple of the options that you talked about um, was a rifampin-soaked graft, an extra anatomic uh, bypass. And uh, did you talk about a NACE procedure, Mina, or no? I didn't actually specifically mention it uh, for reconstructing the aorta, but that's definitely one of the options. Yeah, it's an option. It's typically not used because now there are other, it, you can use autologous graft, cryopreserved grafts, things like that. But this has been used in the past for oral board. You do need to know about it. You do need to at least have an idea about what these are. You're using the femoral and the 
femoral, the femoral popliteal veins, and you reconstruct the aorta using the vein. Uh, the other thing, Alfio, he talked about the timing, right? He said he'd wait about three days or so. What do you think about that timing? Do you think that's a little long to wait? Yeah, I think you know it, it's not unreasonable to, he's not toxic. If you were going to wait because you wanted a culture that, let's say, you wanted to ensure that you were covering everything before you went in to do anything, seem un- not unreasonable wait for the blood culture to come back. But I'm not I'm not too keen on the concept of putting an axe fem in and then waiting three days because you still have an infective source in the belly could seed your graft. So generally, people will do it the same day, but let's say they're sick and you want to see how they tolerate it. Certainly the next day is, is reported. Three days is a bit much. And then getting back to Dr. Singh's comment, which is a reasonable one, is, you know, rifampin, so grafts in certain parts of the body, you know, you have no options because extra anatomic doesn't exist. So the rifampin or whatever beads or bacterials you can place help, certainly like the ascending aorta, because there's not many options. So the inferior aorta, when would you decide to use either rifampin or a neo aorta through vein would be when it gets a little complicated. And I would, to, to make it simple, complicated would be, you know, if it's an affected aorta by fem where you did it for, let's say, occlusive disease and you have plenty of neck from the renals to the graft that you can over sew it or staple it that certainly buys you um, a little bit of comfort in the era of you know we present as an, aor- uh, an aortic graft infection and in, for an aortic aneurysm in the era of endo you know years ago some of the aortas may have been distal disease you could have still some proximal neck that is suitable if there's no suitable proximal neck because you sew right up to the renals those are the situations where you may want to consider if it's not that bad of a bug to do it in line with rifampin or do the vein because it gets a little complicated when you don't have a stump to start doing renal bypasses in an infected field. If you're going to bypass the renals with synthetic, I wouldn't use femoral veins. I would use uh, creative saphenous veins. But th- these are great questions to ask. I don't think you would get necessarily get ding. I don't think you, I think you did well in the questioning. But just prepare yourself. It's, it's reasonable to ask questions before you venture on to answers. In other words, a question like that, when you uh, reviewed the three options, you started on the right path by saying, you know, if he's a sick and elderly patient, I do extra anatomic. And that's certainly wise. But the second part of that is, you know, what anatomy are we talking about in terms of what you need to replace? Certainly a tube graft is easier to replace than a long segment graft. If it's right up to the renals, it's a little bit more complicated to deal with the stump if it's by daily application. So it's reasonable to ask questions like that because it goes a long way with buying you some credibility in terms of points. And then the answers could be, because it wouldn't necessarily be wrong if you said, well, in that case, because it's so close to renals, I'm worried about not having enough of a stump and having to deal with the renals. I may consider doing a, uh, a you know, rifampin or a vein bypass or, or I'm sorry, a, a neo vein creation. Yeah, that's a great point. Also, don't forget, if they're pushing you towards bypassing to the renals, you'll always have options of spleno-renal bypass, hepatic renal bypass, because that aorta is going to be very friable. But to Dr. Crotchio's point, it, it all depends on how bad it looks. If there's overt pus and the, the tissue is just so bad, then you don't have any other option other than a, an extra anatomic bypass that's uh, but if it doesn't look so bad then you know you do want to talk about those other options any other questions uh, dr crotchio for that first scenario no no i think that uh you did you actually did well on that you know it's just a matter of practice and you get the build up confidence but your answers were were sound yeah and uh, for the for the second scenario you know even you know he's pushing you he's going to push you towards an aorta bifem or some type of an operation but and i know you know this already me now in mo- most of the residents, the fellows, they know this already, but claudication, you treat claudication the same way every single time, even though, you know, at some point you're going to have to operate, but you can't just jump out and say, I'm going to operate. Now, it's for the listener, it's easy to say, well, yeah, he should do this, that, and the other thing. But when you're under the gun, you know, that happens. So remember claudication, uh, medical management, right? Stop smoking, aspirin, statins is very important. Also, he mentioned about pletal. And yeah, you do need to know the dose, 100 milligrams BID. And what's important about pletal when you're talking about evidence, you said there's questionable evidence. Well, they if you say that, then they will ask you about the evidence. The evidence with pletal is it's proven to increase walking distance about 50%. So you do have to know those numbers. With that second scenario of the end-to-end, end-to-side, that was very good. You picked up on that. He asked you about that. So that was very good. The other thing is the IMA. Dr. Crotchu, you asked about IMA. He did. I mean, it's, 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 it's I, I just tossed it in there because as a reminder, it'd be reasonable questions to ask because if you um, end-to-end to sacrifice the IMA, I, I would always ask beforehand, you know, I, 
I gave you the opening of the uh, externals being small and the hypos are open. The um, question I'd have, and you, and you said it appropriately, you know, you go to the femorals and retrograde to fill the hypos, it's fine. You know, is it assumption? That's what I mean by technical nuances. You wouldn't get it wrong with what you did, you know, doing the end to end. But, you know, if you want a certain level of, you know, advanced sophistication in terms of transmitting your, your knowledge base, you can say, you know, as you ask through, is the IMA open? Is it large? Is the hypo small? Because they could say they like tiny hypos and they have a huge IMA. It may steer you to just point out the fact that, say, you know, if the IMA was um, closed, I would probably do an end to end because you could retrograde fill the hypos. But since they're small and the IMA is large, and again, we don't have pictures here. But that's something that you always take a couple of minutes. Don't feel rushed. Look at the pictures because if they send you the pictures, that's something you can point out. Say, ordinarily, I do an end-to-end, -end, but here I would consider end to side just because the IMA is large and the hypos are small. Or if the IMA is small and the other way around, the hypos are large, there's no sense in doing an end to side. You know, the flow is better in end-to-end. You know, by hemodynamics supposedly, and um, and you wouldn't be worried about it. You say it oversaw it, but those um, the uh, hypos are large enough. It sh sh I don't expect it to be the problem. And reimplanting a small vessel probably um, wouldn't be necessary, but certainly with a chronic ischemia. So you you could always explain your way through. But you did well. Yeah, good job, Mina, uh, Doctor Crutch. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, sure thing, guys. Happy to help. Excellent. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, guys. Thank you for your time, sir. Appreciate it. Dr. Singh, I did have a question. If you have a patent IMA when you're doing an aortic bifemoral bypass and you end up doing an end-to-end -end anastomosis because the external iliac is open, would you be worried about that patent IMA and would you like it or re-implant it? Okay. Uh, I think you already answered that question during Dr. Crocio's questioning about the IMA, uh, whether you do an enteside or a side-to-side -side anastomosis. Just remember that the, the lower part of the large intestines is supplied by the hypogastrics as well as the IMA. So if the hypogastrics are occluded, then it's a very good idea to re-implant that IMA, especially if it's, a, if it's big enough. Now, remember when you're doing aortic surgery, uh, aneurysm surgery, you open up the aorta and you can see the back bleeding from the IMA. In this case, uh, where you have aeroiliac occlusive disease, you're not necessarily going to open up the IMA, transect the IMA to look for bleeding from the IMA. You just have to make that determination based on pre-op imaging. So if you look at the CAT scan, the CAT scan shows pretty robust size IMA and you're doing a end-to-end -end anastomosis, say the common iliacs are occluded, you're not going to have any feeding of that IMA. So you're obligated to reimplant that IMA if it's a healthy size IMA. So you answered it correctly, but that's typically how you want to address the IMA. One other question that I had, Dr. Singh, um, in cases of uh, aortoiliac uh, disease and the patient is a clodocant, do you think it's enough to treat one level of disease? Say the patient had femoral disease and popliteal disease as well. Does it make a difference if you treat one level or do you have to treat both levels? We're talking about lifestyle limiting or debilitating claudicants. We're not talking about just treating regular plenal claudicants, right? Which treated medically. But yes, for, so for claudicants, you don't need to go all the way down and start uh, messing around with SFA and popliteal and what have you, especially when the iliacs are diseased. So if you just by treating the iliacs alone, um, most of these patients will get better, right? Their claudication symptoms will will improve. You don't need to have them back to, you know, running a marathon, but their claudications will improve. So treating that should be enough. Dr. Crotch, you asked you on that, on that patient with aeroiliac occlusive disease, whether you would manage him uh, with an endovascular therapy. You certainly can and see how that patient does as long as you don't burn the bridges. But I think the scenario that he gave you, the disease went all the way up to the renal. So putting stents close to the renals might cause a problem later on if that doesn't work. And now you're going to do the aerobifem bypass, plus you're on a young patient. But in a patient that's debilitated, uh, an endovascular approach, and especially if they're clotted cancer, uh, is, is not a bad approach. Okay. Perfect. Thank you very much, Dr. Zim. That is all for this episode. We promise to bring more mock oral board reviews in the future. We would really like your input and thoughts on this episode. So do leave us a comment and share this podcast with your friends and colleagues. If you would like to take part in these mock oral reviews as an examinee, do shoot me a DM on my Twitter. My handle is Andrew Pod. Thank you for listening.